Hello there, it's Josh. Welcome to Stitch of Fate, a Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition podcast meant for a mature audience. We're going to be playing vampires who have left their mortal world behind and will do unpleasant things that deal with difficult themes and content that is including, but is not limited to, body horror, murder, gore, extreme emotional situations, and graphic images. Remember, don't hold the actions against the players, just the characters like you're meant to. Take care of yourself and take a break if you need it. everybody, and welcome back to some more Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition podcast, Stitch of Fate. I am your storyteller, Mike Martin, and I am joined, as always, by my wonderful four players, Josh, Chelsea, uh, I was gonna, I was gonna, I want to say Bub, but your, I know your name is David, but I've never, like, that just sounds wrong yes. coming out of my mouth. It's is true. Thing. And yeah. of course, Mark. How's it going, That's everybody? That's what your How real you name been? is? My name is actually David, yes. Oh, Hey, David. It's a very normal name, right? <laughs> Hello, David. <laughs> right? Oh, it's going to be so weird. That's it. Um, hey, that's it. I, I hope everybody's doing well. This is our, uh, for the listeners at home, our second session coming together and recording a next batch of episodes. So it's been a little while for us. So we're going to do a little bit of a recap for our sake and for your sake. And because I'm a cruel master, I'm handing it off to Josh to oh, go God ahead and it. recap it. <laughs> he was, yes. oh, no. You were looking too comfortable in your seat and... Uh, Sean is, if anything, a not a comfortable character. Well, it worked. Thanks for getting me into character. <laughs> oh, um, I'll help. Go ahead and I'll help get, 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 oh, get, no. get into character. Find that uncomfortable instability that is Sean. No, what it, happened it, last it's week? fine, really. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> we began Stitch of Fate with a vampire called Grant who had broken the rules of our club, the Succubus Club, where... Duke, Max, Vera, and Sean all worked together. And the rule that this dude broke was the rule of look, don't touch. He had tried to feed in our club, so we chopped off his hand. And that wasn't enough, so we made him owe us a boon. Um, then we changed his clothes and threw him out into the gutter, essentially. We did invite him back. <laughs> We were very, very kind, I think. Comparatively to others, I believe so, yes. <laughs> I felt our hospitality was unmatched. Yeah, I'm sure that won't have any repercussions. After that, we got the message that the Thin Blood Primogen wanted to have a meeting. And at this point, I believe everyone was like, so Sean, what do you know? And uh, Sean was like, no, I don't. Anything. Um, which is pretty normal. At that, which point, the Thin Blood Primogen arrived and told us that the prince's ghoul had gone missing and he had a pretty good idea about where to find him. So the deal we made was that we could pass this off as our own uh, discovery and gain any advantage out of it that we could from the prince while the situation regarding this death, all the information we discovered went to the Thin Blood Primogen. It's obviously a little bit shady and we didn't really trust him fully, but we went because the ghoul was supposedly killed in our domain, which is a place that we control. So we, we as in Sean, Max and Duke, left the club and went to the location in our domain that the Thin Blood told us about Upon entering, Max smelled blood, and eventually discovering the dismembered corpse of this ghoul, Ben, horrifically murdered, was missing a head? Horrifically dismembered might also be viewed as an art piece, still to be determined. <laughs> the head had been weird. removed from its shoulders and balanced on the bed frame above the body. Oh boy. With a painted halo, right? And a bunch of and, uh, magical the, the, runes. And its head, uh, the cap, having, the skull cap having been <clears throat> removed. Yeah, limbs everywhere, blood everywhere. Um, Sean was thoroughly disgusted, while Ma uh, Max and Duke were like, hmm, good handiwork. 
Um, we then, I think, bagged it up and, <laughs> and went home. Hey, 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 I just want to state for the record, I didn't think that was good handiwork, all right? <laughs> I was a sloppy. Nah, I, it was I just... Uh, probably... I just don't uh, have an artistic appreciation for this kind of thing like Duke does. I do think, though, that even if you can't appreciate it the same way that Duke does, we can all agree that using technology so frivolously is a mistake, which is what we saw from our favorite right, thin blood. Yeah, he had a laptop on him uh, with the password of password, so they can't <sighs> be that smart. Um, oh, I meant you using Sean... the phone repeatedly, snapping pictures and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, remember that. Sean did you... that. We, we haven't even discussed why that's a problem, but we'll get onto that at some point, I'm sure, when it bites me in the ass. Um, yeah, so after getting told not to use a phone, which Sean didn't like, uh, we discovered a laptop which had pictures on it of Sean, which freaked him out a little bit. From there? From there, it was a simple return to the Haven, an unloading of the information, um, a return of the Thin Blood Primogen, of which you basically told him very little. And a, a wrapping of the night, knowing that something in the next few nights was coming for uh, all of you. He had a big, yes, a big business deal. Yes, and this will deal. teach you not to give the recap to me because it takes a while. <laughs> Listen, there's three episodes <laughs> was, of recap right there. Right? I mean... <laughs> so, with all of that done, thank you very much, Josh. Let's reel everything back in. Let's set the scene. The screen fades in from black, looking at a nice clear sky with a half-filled moon. A few clouds scatter by as the camera pans downward and we see a bustling street of people mashing together. A large line outside the succubus club and a, and a bouncer, kicking some people out of line and allowing some others in. But as the camera reaches street level and we hear the honking of horns and the sirens of uh, the blaring sirens of police cars and emergency vehicles somewhere in the distant New York City skyline, we find our way behind the club. A small truck has been backed up, and the opening has uh, been lifted as a bunch of big paintings are being unloaded and slowly brought into the back of the succubus club. We follow one uh, general, uh, I should say, we follow a pair of two generic men carrying one of these paintings into the back before the camera detaches and spirals down to the basement, where we see our four coterie once again gathered together. Duke sitting at a desk, plugging away at some numbers and scratching away with his pen very diligently and very stoically. Everybody make me a rouse check for this evening as you all awake. Or represent being awoken maybe an hour or so ago. Vera needs to feed. Vera gains a hunger. Duke gains a hunger. Sean does not gain a hunger. And Max gains a hunger. The beast this night, through all of you, for one reason or another, and perhaps it was the excitement from the night prior. Truly claws at the back of your mind a little bit. That should bring most of you to hunger too, I'm imagining then, yes? Yes. Okay. Vera is at three. While it's certainly not overpowering for those where it hits two, Vera, it's hard now to ignore the constant thoughts in the back of your mind. Everything that comes forth from your mouth has that tinge of hunger to it. A little bit of uncertainty, a little bit of uh, irritability consistently you think about the blood but a three is still manageable so as we pick up and the camera settles on this distant frame of our four coterie members and vocals start uh, becoming audible and we can hear them speaking we realize what they're speaking about is a deal coming around in about two nights and sean has asked a question that has frustrated the three of them because it's very clear he has no idea how this business is actually run uh you're telling me that we shift this stuff by stuffing it in paintings. Oh, brother. No. Why would we stuff it into paintings? We're selling paintings, so like... Correct. That is our business. We sell no, paintings. But we're also selling the... That we are also... We're in the process of distributions. Thank you, Duke. Then how does it get distributed? Paintings is a cover. You have to understand that this is something that takes time. No, I no, I I, un I understand. Well, to you appear told me above times, board, but like we have individuals come in to buy those paintings, and we can't just, as you would say, willy nilly pass out copious amounts of recreational drugs. 
as a sample. They have to know what they're getting themselves into. Sean, ever wonder why <laughs> drug dealers have great art on their walls? Uh, because they've got a lot of money? Because the paintings are a perfect cover for picking it up. What we do here I, is completely legitimate. We sell paintings, yes? And I kind of gesture to all of the paintings. And as you say yes, you, there's the footsteps and the grunts and the shouts of other uh, just laborers bringing in uh, large large art pieces and whatnot, making sure not to break it or anything. Hey, don't, no, don't lean it on its face. God damn, you hear someone running off. Not like that. This piece, and I gesture to one maybe that's almost unwrapped. Price tag of $50,000. Now, as a man of the streets, you know how much... That could get you in, say, a fine white powder. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly how much that gets. And it won't fit in that painting. It will not. So they come, they buy and purchase, and when they are done, it is their pickup that is, say, a little richer. Uh, okay, okay. It's a completely off-site system and entirely legitimate. If the cops were to, say, break in on our little tete-a-tete -tete in a few nights, there would be no drugs on site. I did find that odd. Odd. Safe. They are about the same in the situation. Okay, good. I'm glad my merchandise is at least somewhere safe. Yeah, don't worry about it too much, kid, all right? Uh, you think too hard, you're going to end up hurting your brain. I guess I've got you for that. It's true. Well, you need your brain hurt? Because I can do it. No, no, the, the, the thinking. It's not my department. Duke smiles, just purses his lips and smiles at that. Is... Is Sean being coy? He's, he's being a little bit cheeky to, to Max. A, a, a playful ribbing. Okay. <laughs> as long as it's just playful. Very Vera just gives you a little bit of an eye. Yeah, you keep up that playful ribbing. We're a regular Ben Grimm and Johnny Storm over here. Uh-huh. Now, Sean. Yeah. You can hear clouds rolling in over as the full as the half moon gets covered outside and the slight pitter-patter of rain begins to fill the streets and umbrellas begin popping everywhere. You are going to be here for this event. Oh, joy. You know more about the pickup items than we do. Yeah. So put on a suit and please tuck that gold chain under your shirt. <laughs> um, it doesn't exactly fit under a collar, but um, I will do whatever you say, Vera. Um, however, where do I get a suit? Oh. Well, you go. You can't you? You are a day walker. Go buy one. Or have one fit Duke. Well, you know how to fit suits, yes? I suppose I do. It's been some time since I've fit a suit, but it's not too difficult. You could always find a men's warehouse. They'll size you on scene. Oh. I'll go do that then. Just look presentable. No need to come with me. You are a sneaky little bastard, aren't you? Yeah, I can get about. Just show up looking presentable, please, and with less cheekiness in your voice. <laughs> Can't get rid of that. Yeah. It's my best feature. Great. I look forward to the sartorial splendor that we're going to be treated to. What are you going to be wearing? I don't know. Bathrobe? Who can say? Nobody's going to see me anyhow. <laughs> oh, I wish I could do that. Max is loud. He's been doing this business as long as I have. Yeah, how long is that? Are you asking my age, Sean? Uh, well, you know exactly how long I'll be doing it, so it's only fair. We've been in business for a while. Enough decades that they can't be counted on your little thin blood fingers. That's a lot of decades. He merely asks out of fear. It was only about a day ago he asked how long it had taken for me to be so calm, cool, and collected. And 
To be honest, it's been some time since I've even asked myself that. He's wondering when he can ascend to such a position. That's not... Oh, Sean! Are you ambitious? I... We'll, we'll, we'll see. I don't know what exactly... Good. How, how deep this goes, you know? Oh, Sean. It is so deep. Go find a suit. Yes, ma'am. And with a skip to his step and a sarcastic salute, we watch as Sean marches his way up the very stairs. One might watch this interaction and be curious and question why does Vera keep Sean around? What exactly does Sean provide to this coterie? Well, it's because of Sean that they're able to get such large quantities of these, shall we say, attached gifts to expensive paintings. While Sean has a small inner circle of friends that he uses for his own personal connections, those friends have higher connections and every so often, a big buy comes from Sean's buddies at the club. And those higher connections are willing to wheel in a little bit of extra for just a slice of the profit. So my question then rolls over to Duke, Max, and Vera as Sean leaves. There is a bit of a slice that has to come out from the supplier of which you get these drugs. What is a, a, um, a price, or should I say a, a percentage, that the, you all would be comfortable losing? I ask merely because also, <clears throat> depending on what you, what you determine, Duke's finance, uh, he'll have a finance role at the end of this to see if you are able to um, keep a, a higher point or a higher slice or percentage of this, of this uh, initial trade. This is basically draw Sean's connections, drug lords coming in to help. I think I think Duke stays stays above board and not really needing in the direction of, of finances. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't really dress to impress. He has no uh, friends outside of uh, his immediate contacts and everything is very business. So he stays very business casual. Um, he doesn't really have any material possessions either that matter to him. So his cut is only what is necessary to appease Vera and allowing him to stay at the club. Vera, your resources are at what? How many? Is it a five? I think I have a three dot in my resources. You have a three dot? Are you the one with the highest resources then? Uh, I believe so, yes. I'm just curious how greedy that... I'm basically asking how greedy is the coterie when it comes to how much money they want to keep for themselves. Uh, Max, uh, although he doesn't really care, he would point out that eh, we should strike a hard bargain just to maintain the veneer of respect and uh, mm -hmm. show that we can't be taken advantage of. How long do you think we've been doing business with them? How long have These... you had Sean? About 10 years, yes. And it probably took Sean a few years to build up to those, those uh, contacts. We'll say half that, five years you've been in business. You probably have two big shows a year. We've been doing this for a while now. Successfully, I might add. And though our coffers are growing, there's nothing stopping it from, say, getting larger. And we have offered quite a bit of security to those that we serve. So, if we were offering ten, why not? Tighten up a little. I agree with Max. We take on a fair share of danger in our activities. If they want to continue doing business with us, we could make it eight or seven. Lucky seven, I says. Max says lucky seven. So it is. Does Duke agree? It's inevitably your call, Vera. I find that this is something that I care not much about. I'm just here to make sure that the numbers fall in line. As I said previously, they're fickle, but they're honest. Well, the good news is so are we. So consider it good business. With the choice of going to seven then and acting as a base, 10% 10, 10 being a base, as you said, kind of like just the flat cut he probably takes, knocking it down to seven would be a three. I want you to, an intelligence finance roll and you're rolling against a difficulty of three. Okay. Intel finance. That what is that? Uh, what, what, what is a, how big is that pool for Duke? Um, that is four intelligence, three finance and one specialty. And with a success of uh, rolling three successes with that pool, you are successfully able to renegotiate and uh, cook the books a bit to keep a bit more 
uh, to yourselves with minimal interference from the actual drug lords when it comes to dealing, doing deals with them. And uh, I don't know if Duke would try to hide the, the expenses somewhere within the math or if he would simply uh, have Vera just bargain with them and cut the deal down with, uh, with his numbers as reason. But for whatever, however, it ends up getting done, you succeed without it, without a Easy hitch. enough. Did you say that you wanted multiple of those? It, the next, when the next show comes around, gotcha. we'll have another roll. And after you, uh, you know, after you accomplish it, um, I'm, I'm, my gut says three, but I, I'm going to think on that for a bit. But after three, uh, store a story bump to resources for Vera, basically, because you all kind of allow Vera to have. Sure. If it would make a difference, um, mm -hmm. I think that Duke would probably not be super satisfied with just meeting status quo. Always excelling matters more to him. Would sure. I be able to willpower? And You're always welcome to willpower. So with your pool, um, you rolled six die uh, without hunger for our, your audio listeners, and only one of those die was a success. Uh, with a willpower, you're able to take three normal dies that were failures and re-roll them. So that is what Duke is going to do. He adds a, a one more success on top of that. So not only do you succeed, but you succeed in a way where um, it adds a little bit of a bonus. Let's say... Before the camera leaves Vera, Max, and Duke in the basement of the club, is there any more conversation the three of you would like to have without your thin blood pet nearby? Or shall we move on to Max? Or not Max, sorry. So move on to Sean. Well, uh, I got a question. How much of a liability do you think the kid is right now? Oh, if I'm to answer that honestly, Max, well, quite a liability. Hmm. And, uh... Have we given any thought to maybe just ratting out the thin blood primogen, Robert? What's his name? Larson. Yeah, him. I have considered it. There is a time and a place for everything, and with an Elysium on the horizon, I feel like maybe we should ask for the favors we want then and play our cards in front of everyone. Fair enough. You're the boss. Are we aware as to what this... Elysium is for what it's being called for. Is this a regular Elysium or is this same special, Mathis? Uh, it is, as far as you are aware, a regularly scheduled Elysium with nothing spe spe specific scheduled. A simple gathering of the kindred to mix and mingle without the pretense of violence or uh, political backstabbing, even though that's not necessarily the case at actual Elysiums. It is our regular meeting. Nothing special that I know of, though. Mr. Larson did make quite a bit of noise about us being there. I think we should be prepared for any uh, unpleasant surprises. I'm inclined to agree. I am as well, though I hope that the prince will be grounded enough to hear that we cleaned up a mess that did not belong to us. I'm hoping to find out if Johan has any additional information for us based on the runes. I'm yet to hear from him, and while I grow worried, I know that he'll eventually need me to run the finances for his business. Plus, I do believe that Max shook him slightly. Oh. Johan. Oh, yeah, he was that guy at the place, right? At the Chantry, yes, the Tremere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. There is a reason that I like having Max around. He knows how to get his way, just differently than I do. Speaking of which, uh, you got any special instructions for tonight regarding security or just the usual? We have crunched in on the numbers a little bit. There's no doubt that there's going to be some asshole that does not like the fact they're making less money. So maybe we should be a little bit more prepared. Okay. It's been a while since we've... <clears throat> done something of that sort so all right all right i won't i won't wear my bathrobe tonight then i'll come loaded for beer i mean you can still wear the bathrobe i heard it hides a gun well mm -hmm. oh wait i heard that from you yeah well i ain't gonna be seen anyhow yes well i'm hoping to maybe uh, be kind enough to give sean a chance a <clears throat> opportunity to maybe speak with some of our higher-end clientele, though his recent sass has left me wanting. Hmm. Well, I hope he doesn't fuck it up. I think that Sean is just trying to find his place. He's still new. Remember what it was like for us, where things were so daunting, so scary as it might seem. Yes. 
You're right, Duke. I should be more patient with him. No, I don't think so. I think you should be stern. You have oh. to show him the reins and the ropes. Now, the, otherwise, he will continue to step two, and the sass that you speak of will only indicatively multiply. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Never one word when 15 will do, huh? I'd rather be thorough. Ugh, all right, look, I'm going to go get a drink. That sounds wonderful, actually. And I'm going to leave that question over hanging over the three of you. Do any of you, would any of you like to feed? Yes, please. I know that we have somebody who's sitting at hunger three. Hunger two is manageable, though the slight itch at the back of your throat and the little nagging reminder, but it's not, uh, not something that's overtaking. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go take care of that little itch right now. I'm going to go hit my icebox. You're, yeah, you don't need to make a hunting roll. You're fine. You make your way down and you have a nice, like you said, a little mini fridge ice. Is it an ice box? Is it, is it an ice box? Uh, yeah. Not a mini fridge? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it probably does. He'd probably be more comfortable with an ice box <laughs> given, his, uh, given his origins. Pop over the plastic lid, you rustle around on the inside, and then eventually there's your plug bag from your buddy that you got in the last time you met yeah, him. Yeah, and you can slurp down to one. Yeah, I reckon I, he probably does have a mini fridge. Let's face it. So yes, he does. <laughs> That's fine too. He gets uh, he gets uh, himself back down to one hunger. Okay, Duke. How about yourself? Duke is a figure of patterns, so everything is is pre laid out. It's pre planned. Um, mm -hmm. So if if it is that time for him to meet up with whomever he's cooking books for. And that means that he gets to feed. Even if he's not hungry, he still feeds. Just because he still ensures he takes the opportunity. Exactly. The night is not that night, but the Correct. night is coming up soon. Mm -hmm. For Vera, how about yourself? Yes, um, Vera is definitely going to feed. Uh, she may not so, have time over the next few nights before this, so she wants so, to get it done. So your hunting type is the... Uh, Osiris. Is it the, as, as I say, is it Osiris? Then you're going to be making a hunting roll against a difficulty in your domain of four. While you're able to pluck from your herd... Um, mingling amounts the, uh, amongst others, you were unable to uh, coerce or coax another into your company for the night, and it happens every so often. Now, of course, you could, if you so choose, no longer wish to hunt, use a power, and, a, and through discipline directly command somebody to feed, but you run the risk of that being seen and noticed, of course. Of course. Um, I don't know that bringing the hunger back down to one is that is big worth of a deal. That, yeah, certainly. As the camera leaves the coterie, it catches back up with Sean as his last two steps up the stairs leading up to the club, hearing that rhythmic thumping music overtake and wash through him, is where we find ourselves. It focuses as it swirls up to his face and he has a decision. He was told, of course, to go find a suit by Vera, but the night is young and you have plenty of opportunity to wander and do your own thing. What does Sean end up doing when he finally breaks free from the coterie for the first time and he can roll his shoulders free of those chains? And he's surrounding himself with a member of the club. He visibly relaxes. He <laughs> shoulders kind of slouch a little bit. Oh, His yeah. posture loosens up. He yeah. He just he takes a walk for a bit. Um, we're in Bl Brooklyn, right? Yes, we are in Brooklyn. So he just takes a walk around the block. And you just go outside, planning on going just for a walk. Yeah. He and what's your hunger? Your hunger is at two. No one. You're good then. He's okay. good. He's good. He's really good for the first time in a little bit. So what he's going to do is uh, probably, well, he needs to go buy a suit and he mm. has a modicum of respect for Vera. So he's going to go in a, and- In a amount of fear. He's going to see if he can find a suit, but this is Sean. So he is going to- he doesn't have any money. He's going to find one that fell off the back of a truck. So what we see is Sean leave the back uh, of the club, move through the alley, and once again merge with the sea of people on a New York street. Now, something mm. others may not know is Thin Bloods, while they are a almost treated or, or not treated as, but referred to as a one clan type of deal. Unlike, say, a Ventru, who all run relatively similar with varying disciplines on a minor scale, Thin bloods can vary wildly in terms of what they can do, how they operate day to day, and so on. And as Sean is bumping into other mortals and the warmth of skin is brushing up against his, the opportunity, or should I say the question rather, that I have is how exactly does Sean operate as a thin blood? They, as I said, vary wildly. Some don't have fangs, some can walk in the day, others not so much. 
as Sean's reminded of his human life. Describe to us what kind of thin blood Sean is. Sean could very easily blend into a crowd because he's halfway between. So this is very, very natural for him. And because of his special abilities, he can also probably do this several hours from now when the sun rises. Um, he's a little frail. He's a little bit cursed and he can feel that, but mostly he just still lives a normal life. And in fact, as he's walking, he probably just phones up his his best friend, Ed, and, and that's just what has saying. a conversation. You, you pop open, you reach into your pocket, you gave one of your phones to Vera, but man, whatever, you know how this rolls, and you pull out another. Drug dealer runs around with one phone. Exactly. You have burner phones upon burner phones stashed away, and you give Ed a call. Uh, one of your, uh, like you said, one of your, your buddies, and, and what's the plan uh, here, just to meet up and have a good night, or what are you looking to do? Um, Yeah, Sean, Sean just says, Hey Ed, uh, I've got some spare time, so uh, do you want to smoke a big one? <laughs> you, uh, as you call Ed, it rings and it rings and it rings. But eventually, before it goes to voicemail, you, you've heard it's the ring right before it goes to voicemail. He always answers, and he flips it on. And uh, you ask him that question. The only answer you hear on the on the other on the other line is a low, barely audible. Oh hell yeah, brother! Where? And you do you have a place you like to smoke, or is it just meet up, find a place, wander? Yeah, it's probably some uh, ratty apartment somewhere. Maybe it's even one of Ed's sure. apartments. It's either or, wait, Ed's one of Ed's, or like Sean's. he has multiple. It's Ed's one apartment that he shares with four others. Yeah. And as you make your way over to Ed's place, a little bit south of the club, maybe a good 20, 30 minute walk, uh, eventually we see Sean climb the stairs to a fourth story run down apartment with windows that have plastic bags over them. Some of them even just boarded up completely with plywood. And as you open the door, a waft of smoke just billows out into the hallway and you are able to just as you breathe it in. It's mostly weed, but there's some other. Is that burnt food mixed? I don't, you're not, my honor, you, whatever, anything. and you head inside. As the door shuts behind you, you look, and in a beanbag chair, um, you see Greg and his, well, that's not the girl he was with last week, but there's a girl on top of him, and they're both completely unconscious. Uh, and while on the couch, you see uh, one of your, uh, there's Ed right there, as I say, one of your buddies, it's freaking Ed, and he's sitting on the couch, leaned up, his legs, uh, one hanging off the side, the other kicked up over the top of his pleather couch that was at one point white, but is absolutely stained a dark yellow. And he has an old yeah. TV, an old tube TV that he has up against the wall. Otherwise, his apartment is devoid of furniture, m minus a pile of clothes that he might sleep on. You're not entirely sure. And he gives you a, a jolly wave, and he's got, like, one eye open. Uh, and he looks like he's uh, he's leaning on his stomach. He's got a spoon and some sort of powder that he's, like, kind of poking and measuring into it. And then he reaches over for a lighter and sits up, and he holds the spoon up and, and just starts... Lighten Sean up just stuff. shakes his head like, "Ugh, that is pathetic. That is is that that's not even white powder you got there, mate. Who have you been buying from? Because oh, it certainly this, isn't me. This is free sample from a new guy. And you just, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You well, and he, he actually kind of just like stops trying to light the lighter that is clearly out of fuel at this point, and just kind of like half acidly offers it to you. <sighs> no." No, he I'm, I'm not. He... I won't. I won't allow this. This is disgusting and filthy, and you should be ashamed of yourself. And out of his pocket, Sean pulls a baggie with the purest white powder that you have ever seen. His I made this half open eye wide opens even wider, and the closed one actually cracks open a bit as he swings his leg off the couch, and you hear just like a heavy stomp. Even a little snort from the sleeping couple in the in the sleeping uh, bean bags before he leans up. He kind of just puts the the spoon over to the side and he just grabby hands reaches for the plastic baggie of, of pure white powder. You are not even conscious. Let me let me deal with this one. He takes up the the like tin foil and the and then the bowl and all of that and just like deals with it. 
and we watch why Sean is uh, the drug dealer of the coterie, expertly handling everything in between as uh, Ed watches in, not awe, but he, he's happy somebody's here to do it for him. And you lose hours. Hours disappear before you kind of come to again, you blink half acidly and you realize it's 2.30 in the morning. Ed is on the floor, <laughs> drooling underneath his, uh, by his chin, just unconscious, snorts. For some reason he's missing his shirt, but you're clothed and the couple's missing. They're gone now. Huh. Uh, uh, hey, Ed, and I kick him. He doesn't move. <sighs> I pull him up, sure. put him properly on the uh, prop him on the on the sofa, and just like shake his jowls around, like just grab shake him his by the face. Ed, Ed, <laughs> you just kind of just and you hear like the smacking of lips as you're shaking oh, the yes. jow jowls around. Before eventually you just go, <laughs> he's like breathing, but he's not coming to. <sighs> Fuck's sake. I'm just gonna like prop him on his side so he doesn't like kill yep. himself. You, you pop him back and, up on his side against yeah. the couch, and you can actually hear the the peeling of leather as one of his legs kind of sticks and falls. Ew. That's disgusting. Um, yeah, and, I prop him on his side, and then I uh, write on a post-it. Like it's not a post-it; it's just a scrap of paper, and like stick it with sellotape to his forehead. Mm -hmm. And it says, "Where do I get a suit? Do you know a guy?" <laughs> Dash Sean. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> and as you stand up and kind of tape this to his head and, and uh, stand to leave and use the, the windows, he's got a great view, by the way, of a brick building uh, across the street with a giant, giant neon advertising sign at the top that never gives true darkness into his apartment ever at any point. Oh, What's great. awareness? Oh, no. Two successes on three dice. You, as you're standing and writing the note and you kind of get a glance of the building and your eyes trail to the outside every so often, you see people, of course, but when you look and you look more, you realize on the other side of the street, as people are, are passing by on the sidewalk in this relatively busy area, they're not like stuck together shoulder to shoulder, but there's a steady stream of people. A single figure hasn't moved in the past five or so minutes. And the more Sean looks, the more he realizes this particular figure if not staring at this window specifically, has certainly been staring at this building the entire time. Do you get a better look of this particular figure? It's something you just, Sean's kind of noticed a couple of times as he's been writing the note and you can't get a great look. You just, it just sticks out. It's just the, as the people walk by, that one figure isn't moving. Uh, Yeah, he's gonna take a quick look out the window before he, uh... As you walk over to the window, he leaves. lean up against it, and it's kind of it's kind of um, hard to see as there's rain streaks down as there's a quick thunderstorm that ended up passing by. You look, and now that you have a much clearer view, the person sticks out like a sore thumb compared to the people that are walking by. She's a young woman. Maybe you'd put her in her late teens, early 20s. She's got headphones on that are a bright, vibrant pink. Uh, of cat ears that lead to the top and very pointedly kind of down. Her hair is a mix of colors, a bright pink and an ice blue split right down the middle on both sides. And she is dressed head to toe in what Sean would consider e-girl paraphernalia. She's got just bright colors, uh, pleather, a pleather jacket, a short skirt, socks that don't match but clearly were made for each other to be worn together. And she's certainly staring at the window as you lock eyes uncomfortably before she snaps and looks down. What the hell? She have those little black drawn hearts Hard to under tell her from, this, from this high up. You can just pick uh, out the very vibrant stuff. Okay. Well, Sean was leaving anyway. He was going to go find a suit at some point. So he goes downstairs and see if he can go out and 2.30 in the morning, Sean, a little bit groggy feeling, not entirely mm -hmm. sure if it's the drug or the kindred or the beast in you that's making you feel that way. But eventually you step down those stairs, all four stories, and make your way out the front door as the metal door gets stuck in the door frame for a minute. You got to give it a shove and it just kind of wobbles before you step out and slam it shut. Do you look to see if that particular figure is still there? Or does Sean just try to, like, get out? Oh, no, he he checks if she's still there. Yeah, and 
as you walk, like look past the people and people walk by, she's still standing there, very visibly looking at you now. And as you lock eyes once again, whether comfortably or not, you she you can see her hand very meekly raise and give you kind of like a not not a nervous wave, but a meek wave. And then she turns and begins to walk. The hell? Sean's gonna check through his um, contacts on his phone and be like, no, it's not her. It's not her. No. No, she was blonde. Uh... The Sean, as as we as the camera comes over his shoulder and we see him pull out his phone and start going through a list of of uh, of girls, does Sean have a type? I'm I'm just curious. Mm-hmm. Yes, he has a uh, he has a type, and I think it's probably uh, like skinny like him, mm-hmm. and. Probably so anywhere from androgynous to uh like ridiculously feminine. Okay. Well, she definitely fits like that frail, thin frame, and I mean e girl's e girl. I mean she was cute. She definitely was cute. There's no denying you like looking at her and she's adorable. But you only got a quick glance of her face. She looked up and, and kind of gave you a quick wave and and began to walk away. Yeah, Sean's just gonna like Shout, hey, do I know you? Uh, as you look, uh, as you shout, rather, she quickly looks over her shoulder. And um, does she, is there a, what kind of, um, what's the tone in Sean's voice when, when he asks? Is it just like an eager curiosity? Is it? Yeah, uh, yeah. it's yeah. like, hey, You're cute. do like, I know you? And yeah, if yeah. she answers, it's because I'd like to. <laughs> and she, she turns uh, and you only catch the side of her, of, of like one of her eyes before she gives a very definitive, but very playful shrug. And begins to to like pick up a little pep in her step, not a run, but a more um, playful, uh, almost skip. Abandoning the quest to find a suit, Sean like crosses the road and follows her. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do you do you try to like quietly follow her, or do you not try to hide? Oh, no, he, he's not he's not being subtle about okay. it. He's. As she looks back and notices that you've, as she watch, she watches you cross the street, uh, and the, the the kind of skip definitely picks up, and she walks. She takes a as soon as you cross over and you and you see her, maybe like twenty feet ahead of you, she takes a hard left. As you follow and catch up, you can see her. She walked down just a side street, and you follow her a little bit further. She continually looks back to ensure that you're following, and it becomes more and more obviously playful with you the longer you follow until eventually she takes a hard right, crosses a street and enters an alleyway uh, between the uh, between a, an apartment building and a local pizza shop that's uh, closing down for the evening. Geo's pie. Um, there's no point in stopping now. <laughs> <laughs> I like Sean. And so Sean crosses over and follows into the alley. There's a big dumpster that she might have gone behind. You don't really see her anywhere. Um, can I please get another, are you, would it, would Sean quickly look or would he spend some time just investigating the, the alleyway looking for? Basically, I'm asking for, would, would I ask, should I ask for a wits awareness from Sean or should I ask for a wits investigation from Sean? Uh, I think if she disappears and he can't track her, then he's going to be, uh, looking, he's not going to be investigating the place. Okay, give me a wits awareness then. Yeah. Wow, it is all successes. You have a, a pool of three die and you rolled three successes. As you peer around the corner, you actually do catch a, a, a little bit of her ice blue ponytail, the, the hair on her right side, whisk behind the dumpster. And as you quickly follow, maybe like, oh, this will be a little fun. You know, you've had dumpster alleyway encounters in your, during your life constantly. And as you turn sure. the corner and look, she's not there, but on the ground, in a perfect circle is a bunch of what you would consider runes sprawled on the ground very neatly not like the crime scene in like a, a hurried manner but very meticulously and organized uh and, and organized in, in in that spot now does, does sean have any points in blood sorcery he may have found some <laughs> runic nonsense on the back of a scrap of paper that you might have may or may not have lifted from a a kindred (laughs) at elysium and they won't miss it can i get an intelligence occult roll from you please 
Oh yeah, sure, that will go. Would, and would would Sean upon seeing it, would you do anything? Would he like mess with it? Would he ex like not experiment? Experiment's the wrong word, but like, mm. how would Sean basically interact with this thing when he's trying to just like when he sees it? Because it's immediately uh, clear to Sean that this is at the very least not mortal. Yeah, no. Uh, Sean, Sean's first instinct would be to like. Obviously, this is a place where she cannot have gone anywhere other than mm -hmm. uh, it po poofed in smoke. So, uh, which is not necessarily out of the realm of possibility. And you do know Max, and Max does disappear all the time. That oh, that's true. Yeah, no, it that's could... his experience. So he's gonna like assume that she's around here. And like suddenly Twig like, oh crap, she's probably a vampire. Um, and like crouch down very quickly and poke the rune with like a bottle that he's grabbed. Sure, as you poke the rune, uh, maybe even a little nervous and you know how, or I should say, you don't know how these runes work. You just know that sometimes they're safe, sometimes they're dangerous, and sometimes they're in between. And as you poke it with the bottle, maybe just a little bit weary and think it and pull it back really quickly, nothing happens. He's going to wave his hand over it. You wave your hand over the runes and nothing happens. It seems safe so far. Huh. It could be uh, that it's inert. You don't know. Shall I make that a cult intelligence roll? You're welcome to. Yeah, to, to Sean's best guess, this is probably inert and used and is completely safe to, at the very least, explore. Um, Yeah, he uh, Sean is going to stand up and if she is anything like Max he will have no way of discovering where she is uh, so he's going to be a little bit on guard but stand one foot on the thing and then tentatively if that doesn't do anything he's going to stand a second one on it as we and see Sean slowly place a foot in very very cautiously and he places what kind of shoes is Sean wearing uh, the, oh, these are the nicest piece of clothes on him. These are uh, like limited edition Nikes. And for some reason he wears them and uses them. And so we see these limited edition Nikes. This first foot slowly press its heel against the asphalt and level itself out. And we can't pan up to Sean as he's wary and his eyes are wide. And then maybe even affirming his suspicions, nothing happens. And so he lifts his second foot and steps in. And as soon as the heel of your second foot meets asphalt, there's a loud clapping noise. And as you maybe even take a moment to reorient yourself, as suddenly the area around you shifts and blurs in a, in a, in a moment's notice, you are now suddenly standing in a bedroom. There's nobody in a, a twin bed nearby, and beneath your feet there is a, um, a circular rune here, well, but much like you stepped into before. You're not entirely sure if it's the same exact runes or not because you don't understand them and you don't have any knowledge in it, but there stands one. And as you kind of get your bearings and look around, you don't see her anywhere, but the bedroom is rather plain. And as you look out the window, you're definitely on the second floor or at least up. You're certainly up. What? He just whispers to himself, what the hell? this he he jumps up and down on this rune like do it again do it again i would know i don't <laughs> want to be jump, here. you walk out and then you walk back into the circle yeah and you just keep going back and forth hoping to make it work you nothing ends up happening in fact you end up scuffing a couple of the runes on the ground that are you're not sure blood or a sort of ink but they were not fully dry and as you scuff them up jumping in and out but nothing ends up happening uh if sean will explore the room and try and sure as you explore the room and just try to get your bearings, before you even have a chance to look out the window, there is a gentle creaking noise that comes from the door leading into the bedroom, whipping around. Whether she was there or not before, you're not entirely sure, but there she stands, much, much clearer. A short five foot two with that bi-colored hair starkly present in the hallway light that spills into the now uh, the rather dark bedroom those cat ear headphones with some music muffled playing underneath that you can even hear through them, clearly blasting. She's got that uh, a neon green pleather coat with a t-shirt underneath that says something in a language you don't truly understand, uh, and, the, and the, the short skirt. She takes a single step in, her head gazing down at the floor before she peers up a little bit. And as she peers up and her eyes meet yours, you can see a smirk, but it's not the smirk that catches you, though initially it's her brightened eyes and their clear interest, but 
As you look and see her smiling, you can see a thick black string brought from the very bottom corner of her mouth up through the top lip, back down through the bottom lip, and cross-stitch all the way across. Her eyes are a gorgeous, piercing blue. I don't know you then, do I? She very meekly, with that smirk, looks down and shakes her head. No. And she takes another step closer. Sean takes a step back. Okay. As uh, she takes a step back, she stops for a moment. And clearly allowing you, seeing that you're afraid, gives you your space. I... I've been told to keep a low profile and be a bit careful. And I seem... uh, My mates would probably tell me off for this. So, uh... Is it alright with you if, uh... I leave. She looks up from uh, that that meek look and a meek look now, and, and fully looking at you in the face. And she, with very pitiable eyes, brings just a finger to her stitched lips, and just kind of gives you the sh- sound, or the sh- sh- motion rather. No sound escapes her lips. She takes a very soft, gentle, cautious step forward towards Sean. Sean's going to make sure that to his back is a window or something. There is a window behind you. You're welcome, of course, if Sean would like to make a uh, a wits insight check. Oh, that's a good point. Yes, I will do that. With uh, while you're certainly feared, the beast inside you is screaming to you that even in its muted voice, the half breed that you are, that this is certainly not a kind. You're not sure if the fear is warranted or not. Or if it's just your natural reaction because you're so, as Duke would put it, ill-informed. But she does seem rather honest in the way she carries herself. Her hands aren't behind her back. She doesn't seem to be fiddling with anything close to her jacket. All appendages, for what it's worth, are visible to Sean as she walks to you. Um, Sean is going to, as she's walking, like, look around... Make sure there's no one else here. Okay, you may wits awareness if you'd like. The wits insight was a two successes, by the way. And the wits awareness is also a two successes, by the way. And taking a glance and even maybe trying, like, as she walks, nervously crouching to see if you see anything under the bed. It does seem like you are at the very least in the clear here. Another step forward, now putting her less than a foot between you and her, inches only. Sean's going to, in that case, revert to his uh, his skills that he's learned on the street and okay. basically look up and down her and figure out if there's anything hidden about her that Are you you using know, a maybe discipline? he can steal if he has to. Are you, oh, you're just like giving her like a quick up and down to see if there's anything you could snag. If there's a knife or if there's a phone... You're just looking to see if she has anything visibly on her other than the headphones. I would need another wits awareness roll. You do not see anything visibly on her. With one success. She consistently, even uh, to Sean's own paranoia, seems as meek and scared as she presents herself. What am I doing here? When you ask that question, she closes the gap completely. Again, how tall is Sean? She's 5'2". Sean's like 5'8", I think I said. So you have a bit of height on her. She pushes herself up onto her tippy toes and presses her front half against you and reaches up to bring her hands next to your chin and is clearly going in for a kiss. Sean is resisting this. Is he? There's no necessarily role. There is no magic at play. There is no disciplines being used against Sean as he even maybe tries to rile up and and, and knows like is something wrong? Am I just, am I being controlled in some way? It becomes apparent that there is no weird disciplines at play. There is no need to, there is no resist role. You may simply choose not to. Okay. Um. Yeah, Sean's going to take a half step backwards and hesitate as you take a step back and even allow, like give yourself a couple of inches 
Her hand graciously falls from your chin down to your chest, and she simply gently presses her hand up against your chest and looks up with you with clearly sad eyes. And then she kind of brings her hand back, crunches it into a fist, and brings it to her side and just gives you a quiet look. I'm sorry that you can't talk, but I I think I have an idea about what you might be. Um, I've got to learn the ropes. And the ropes include me being told, uh, told to be cautious. There's no way to explain the way her face changes from meek to almost wounded. I'm, I'm sorry. I, uh, she recoils I really her am. hand a little bit and even gives a half a step back. Her, her eyes break from your gaze and she looks almost completely ashamed. And her body, her, her uh, body language echoes that same sentiment. No, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. I'd like you incredibly hot. Like, I, this is As Sean very... fumbles as with his words, she rushes forward to you, throws her arms around you, and she just reaches up and just tries to plant a kiss onto your lips. Sean may recoil and turn his head if he chooses. It's not an aggressive. I don't want to say it's aggressive. One, in, okay. in, my, in my young days, one might refer to this as glomping. Yeah, Sean at this point doesn't resist. No, he's he's. And she simply plants a kiss on your lips. There's no roll. There's no resistance. Disciplines, and it lasts for maybe a half a second to a second before she presses herself off of against you. She once again brings her hand to your chest and just places it there. Before it slowly gets dragged up your chin again, and she just draws a line, uh, not not across your forehead, uh, just like a line tracing your face, like. She drags it up through your chin, traces around, and then kind of drags it down and lets the fingertip of her index finger just hang on your lip for a little, little long before she pulls it back. She turns and she hardly leaves the bedroom. Uh, whoa, was it that bad? You hear the footsteps going down the stairs. As a few seconds pass, you hear the door, uh, the front door open and shut. If you look out the window, you never see her uh, hit the sidewalk or hit the streets. And it's now as you look out the window looking, you realize where you are. You can actually see the dim glow of the succubus club a couple blocks down. The fuck is going on here? And on that baffled question, the camera will pull back and we will end this particular episode here. Hey, it's Sean. Now, I'm sure you've heard Vera say no phones, but if we're going to break a billion followers, then I'm going to need you to do me a little favor. If you could hop onto Twitter and follow us at Pod by Night, that would be mint, and a five star review on iTunes ain't going to hurt either. And maybe I'll share some of them spicy DMs with you. Cheers, mate. Special thank you to Kimberly and Sean Casey for sponsoring this podcast. Stitch of Fate wouldn't be possible without your incredible kindness and support. You sure know how to rouse our blood.